We praise God this morning. Come on, wave your hands in the spirit of God. All of you who are joining us by Facebook, we thank God for being outside on another beautiful day. How many know the virus didn't get us? The devil didn't get us, and we are here to worship the name of the Lord. I hope you came for a word today because there is a word from God today. Just a couple of quick things so those out there may know where we are. Um, we thank God. You know, when, when you're doing technology and you're doing worship outside and you're being courageous enough to move in God, whatever happens, God knows how to straighten it out. Come on, put your hands together. Blow some horns. Let somebody know. God can straighten it out. I want you guys to know this is our second parking lot service and last week I got a tan. Wow, looks like I'm gonna get another one. So I'm gonna get a tan on top of a tan. But I do want you to know that yesterday, um, please know that when you give to this ministry, if you go online, that we have some exciting things going on in the ministry. I can't even tell you all of them. The least of which is we have our um, our Celebrate Recovery, which is a place where people can go when they're going through mental uh, situations and they're under depression and struggling. So I thank God that we kept that ministry going, that we knew that God needed us to have that ministry going. We're still feeding people. We're still talking to people. There's just so much going on, but I got to get to the word of God today. Thank you for joining us. One quick word. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say to you that we are aware. I want you to be aware that this country needs prayer. prayer. I could not believe after leaving a rally yesterday that there was another shooting last night in Atlanta. I can't believe that we have to add the name of Raynard Richard Brooks to all the other names of those who did not have to die. So in my prayer, as I go into this word, we have a word from God today. In my prayer, as we go into this word, I want you to please pray with me. I want you to please pray with me right now. I'm good. Father God, we thank you today. We ask God that you, thank you for your spirit that's already here. We ask that you would bless us, Lord, as we go into this word, that hearts would be calm, that minds would be quickened, that your love would be felt in every car and all over, and those who are listening by technology. Lord, allow your word to take preeminence. We bind Satan in anything that will come against your word. And Lord, allow your power to come through boldly today. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to go with me to the book of Esther. The book of Esther. The book of Esther, an Old Testament book. The book of Esther. Chapter 4. If you're there, say amen. You know how to say amen if you're there. <laughs> say amen. So I, There you go. So I know you got it. I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. Chapter 4 of the book of Esther, beginning at verse 10. I feel the spirit of God already. And Hetach came, excuse me, verse 9. And Hetach came and told Esther, the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatach and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants, the people of the king's providences, do know that whosoever, whether a man or a woman, shall come into the king's inner court, who has not been called there, there is a law that he is to be put to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out. have not been called in these 30 days. Mordecai, Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to Esther, think not thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether hold your peace at this time, then shall their deliverance arise from another place. 
but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade return to Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink these three days or night. I also, my maidens, will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to see the king. Today we're going to talk about, as long as the Spirit of God will allow I want you to go with me on this thought, prospering in tough places. Prospering in tough places. I have great news for you today if you are a child of God. I need you to understand something, that nothing that has happened in your life, and I mean nothing, was happened by luck or fate, or some cosmic roll of the dice. It did not happen because of chance, because of coincidence. It did not happen because of karma. No, I want you to know something, and here is what God needs you to understand. Everything that has happened in your life has been purposed by the preeminent power and providence of God. Nothing in your life has been left to chance. What am I talking about? God in your life, you don't know how you made it this far? Let me tell you. God has opened doors that you couldn't open. God has closed doors. Come on. When what was behind door number three was going to mess me up, God closed that door. I need you to know that God has fixed some messes in my life. I'm not the only one God has fixed messes for in your life. And I need you to know that, watch this, not only does God fix messes when the devil tried to destroy me. You know why I overcame? I was all out of strength. But you know what God did? He reached down and told the devil, no, I still got work for her. I still got work for him. And so God made sure the enemy did not destroy my life. And let me tell you this, and then there's times I try to destroy my life. But God wouldn't even let me destroy my life. You know what God did? When I messed up, and I'm glad about this, he picked up the pieces. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He picked the pieces of my life up, put my life back together again. So I need you to know everything. The air you breathe, the blessings you have, all you have received. When you were sick and got well, it was God. When you didn't have money but you made it, it was God. When things were down, it was God. Somebody ought to shout, I know it was God. What am I talking about? The psalmist said it like this. Psalms 37, 23. Follow this way. Psalms 37, 37, 23 says this. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way. Now that's good. But let me give you the New Living Translation. God directs the steps of godly people. And he makes sure that he takes care of every detail in their life. Oh, the psalmist just told us there's nothing God don't think about in your life. Every detail. You didn't cry and stop crying on your own. God dried your tears because he knew you were about to cry. You didn't make it out of that bad place on your own. God restored you so you could be back here now. I know some of us know what it means to be in a tough place, but we are so glad that we got a God who knows how to work it out. Paul picked it up in Romans 8.28. He said, we know. I like the first part of that. And we know. This scripture doesn't work unless you know. And we know all things work together for good to those who are called by. I'm just trying to show you that God is in control of your life. Not only that, Proverbs, Solomon picked it up in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. Here it comes again. He will direct your path. Do you know? tried to go left but God took you right because he was about to mess up? Do you know you were about to fall down? God picked you up because he knew if you stayed down you wouldn't get to where you were. So everything in your life has been brought about by the power and providence of God. Let me teach you some Bible right now. We are talking about a doctrine theologically that's called the divine providence of God or God's divine providence. Theologically. What does that mean? It means that we believe God is the creator of heaven and earth, and anything that happens in the universe is controlled by him. How does he control it? Number one, he controls it by his sovereignty. God is sovereign. 
Well, I'm so glad he's sovereign. You know why? He does what he wants, when he wants, with who he wants. That's why God can take somebody like you and me. I know you don't act like you're happy right now, but you know God shouldn't have chose you. But he does what he wants to do. And when other people counted me out, God said, my sovereignty said, you're still with me. Hallelujah. By his sovereignty, watch this, by his guidance. He guides our life by the power of the Holy Spirit, sometimes with our cooperation and sometimes without your cooperation. God works in you and guides your life through the Spirit of God so that you can survive. Not only does he guide it by his sovereignty and by his God, watch this, by his control. He turns stuff around in our life. Come on, man. This is so plain. Stevie Wonder can see it. Don't you see that everything you're standing on, nothing's going to give way because God is holding you up. I wish I had about three people that understood. God is the one that's holding you up. Quit trying to act like it's your power. But God has been doing it. So what God did was, oh, 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 let me put it like this. So um, um, aren't you glad that when you got saved, even though you weren't looking for God, aren't you glad he was looking for you and found you? How many know since he found you, he called you, he chose you, he blessed you. And every scripture God has in his word is so your life will get better. What am I talking about? Now listen to me. Don't get this twisted and think I'm saying you're never going to be sick. You're never going to have troubles. You're never going to have problems. No, I said nothing like that. Because when Apostle Paul was talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, he told Timothy this words. No, all who live godly shall suffer persecution. But then David followed up, so we have a smile right behind what Paul told Timothy. David said, uh, Psalms 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous but God will deliver us out of them all now I wish that was the end man that's a I ain't acting good as I'm preaching but that's alright watch this that's not even the best part here's the best part not only did God say I'm going to prosper you I'm going to get you I'm going to keep you in tough places here's the best part God said not only will you get out of tough places not only will you go through tough places he said but while you're in tough places you're going to prosper to a new level when you come out come on somebody got to believe me Job come on Job testify so the folk know what I'm talking about Job said I lost everything I was sitting down there in sackcloth and ashes, had boils all over my body. But when I looked around, I was in a tough place. But you know what happened? When I got out, I got double. Come on, somebody don't hear me. Job said, I was in a tough place, but God knows how to take a tough place and turn it around. So now I'm better off than I was before I got in the tough place. Not only God said he gave you double, you don't believe me? Ask the three Hebrew boys. They were in the fire. Fire was a tough place. But you know what happened? When they got out, they got promoted. Daniel went into the lion's den. Tough place. But when he got out, all of his enemies were gone, and he was promoted again. I want you to know David was in a tough place. Nobody else would fight the giant. But David decided, I'm going to fight Goliath. He was in a tough place, but he became king, songwriter, man after God's own heart. And today, I'm getting there, y'all. Esther is our example. Esther, a little girl from nowhere. Matter of fact, she was orphaned and raised by her cousin Mordecai. But Esther got into a position where she was in a tough place that she had to do something that she knew would kill her. She decided to do it anyhow because she just continued to trust in God. Look at the 16th verse of the 14th chapter, and we're going to slide right into this text. Come on. God said, I prosper you in tough places. I wish somebody had a shot knew what that meant. That means if something going wrong in your life right now, oh, hold on. You're getting ready to go higher. God's getting ready to take you to a new place. God's getting ready to do some stuff in your life that will, you could only learn by being in that tough place. 16th verse of chapter 4 says, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days. And he said, tell all the maidens and I will do the same thing. I'm going to see the king. If I perish... I'm going to perish, but I'm going to go anyhow. Do you realize there's a lot of people you missed your blessing because you did not go? Esther's going to show us how to prosper in tough places. I want you to write these three things down. You know, I like to give you a road map. Here's what Esther's going to draw out. Here are the principles and precepts we're going to learn from Esther. Here's, Here's what, what Esther, Esther said. said. First of all, she said, you got to learn how to keep trusting when you're in a tough place. 
Keep trusting God when you're in a tough place. Amen. Secondly, keep acting when you're in a tough place. Keep acting. I mean, keep on producing action. Don't get stuck somewhere crying, whining, wanting somebody to deliver you. You got to realize God is the only one can get you out of your tough place. Keep trusting. Keep acting. And watch this. Keep prospering in a tough place by expectation. I expect to get better. I wish there was two people that could grab on the hold of that just tell somebody. I expect. I know somebody's down right now. Can you let somebody know this ain't my first rodeo? This ain't the first time I saw trouble. I expect my life to get better. Any expectators out there that believe that because God is in my life, oh, I'm about to do an outside park parking lot march dance right now. Because I found out something. I expect God to get me out of this situation. No matter how bad it is. Okay, okay, I gotta calm down and do some teaching. Go with me to the text. So we got to find out the book of Esther. Let, let me show you something. Was set a hundred years after the Babylonian captivity. You remember the book of Ezra and Nehemiah? Well, some of the Jews came back from Babylon and some didn't. There was a small tribe of Jews still in Babylon. Shushan. And now it was the Persian Empire. Because you can remember that Persia took over and destroyed Belshazzar. So now we're looking at the Persian Empire a thousand years later, run by a king called Ahasuerus. But Ahasuerus now has widened his kingdom. They went from India to Ethiopia, and he had 127 provinces. And here he was now, as we look at the book. There are four characters in the book we got to understand. There is Esther and Mordecai, the Jews. Esther, called Hadai, and Mordecai, her cousin. Then there is the king, Ahasuerus. And then there is Haman, one of the king's uh, advisors. And we find out Haman is the villain in our text. And we find out that in this story, I'm going to catch this up so we can slide right in there. Here's what has happened so far. The book opens up with Herasuerus throwing a big feast for all of his provinces and all of the lords in his provinces. He just want to show off his castle. So they're sitting there drinking. It's going to last for 180 days or six months. They're going to sit around and drink together. And they were feasting and he was showing the beauty of his castle. But not only that, King Queen Vashti had all the women in her part of the castle and they were having their own feast. Well, when the men start drinking too much, they decided that they wanted to have Vashti come out with some of those women. So he sent for Vashti. Wrong move. Vashti said, I ain't coming. She should not have done that because the king got angry. All of his advisors said she going to teach all of our wives to act like that. You know what the king did? We can't do this now. He wrote a decree that said all wives got to let your husband run the house or you die. Let me say that again. All wives got to let the husband be in charge or you die. I saw some of y'all pop y'all neck to my, I'd be dead then. I hear I still heard you. Some of y'all would have been dead. But that was the decree. You got to let your husband run out. Okay. He moved on. After that, they came to him and said, you got to do more than that. Get rid of that style. Have your beauty contest. The one that wins will be your new queen. So all of a sudden, he got together, had a beauty contest. Here come little old Esther from nowhere. I told you God is working behind the scenes. You know, I'm sure I want to tell you something about this book. There's something that's really remarkable about this book that lets you know it's about, it's about God's providence and not about us. Do you know God's name is not mentioned one time in this book? Amen. Not one time in the whole book. But you know what? You sure can see him work. And I know some of y'all, you've been saved long as I have. There's some times where we may not see what God does. But how many of y'all know I know when he's been there? Come on, y'all. The old folk used to say, see, some of y'all got to be some good old Baptist folk like me. We used to say, my soul looks back and wonder how I got over. Every now and then, God is so good. I didn't see him coming. I don't know how he did it. I don't know when he did it. But I got to look back and say, man, I was there and I'm here. Because of God's goodness. I'm, let, me, let me keep on. Let me keep on. Enters Haman the Agite. We check the text. Haman was a Haggite. He actually got prominence in the kingdom. Everybody who walked by Haman was supposed to bow. Mordecai decided he wasn't going to bow. Haman got upset that Mordecai wouldn't bow. Well, here's how God's hands of providence comes in to turn your life around and guide your steps. You know what happened? Just so happened that Mordecai saw two of the king's soldiers plotting to kill him. He went and told Esther. Esther told the king and Mordecai got 
credit for saving the king's life. Back to Haman. Haman now was mad. So he said, he found out Mordecai was a Jew. He said, I'm going to kill all the Jews. So he got the king to write a decree to kill all the Jews. When he got the king to write a decree to kill all the Jews, he went to the king the next day. Because that wasn't good enough. He put a long pole in the ground, stay with me, that had a sharp point on it. And he was going to impale Mordecai on the stick. He built a trap for Mordecai. But what happened is he went to tell the king. I want permission to kill Mordecai. Stay with me. I'm, I'm almost there. Stay with me. This is Bible. And look what he said. And the king said, what should I give to a man that's special to me? And Haman said, well, um, you, can, uh, you can give him, you know, a parade. Every, every time he rides down the street, let everybody bow. The king said, that's a great idea. Take it and do that for Mordecai. I mean, do that for Mordecai. I want you to put Mordecai on one of my best horses. I want you to lead him around the street. Y'all don't hear me. God will turn your enemies into your servants. He made Mordecai. He made Haman. Come, listen to me. Don't you worry about people who are against you. You got God on your side. And if God is on your side, all you got to do is pray for those folk. And God's going to move it out of the way. Where are the folk that can testify? God has flipped that strip. Turn stuff around. And he prospered you. So he made Haman get impaled on a stick. But where we are right now in the text, because I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, this fourth chapter, Mordecai has just found out that the decree for the Jews to die has been written. He was in a tough place. Haman threw a die, which is called a purr. Don't lose that. And he said, wherever it lands, that's the day we're going to kill all the Jews. It landed on the 13th day of Adar. So here we are. Esther don't know anything about it yet because Esther has kept her identity as a Jew secret. So now we pick up Mordecai is in the square, first verse of chapter four, and he's in sackcloth and ashes and he's wailing. He found out he's in a tough place. Can I tell you, trouble is going to come in your life. If you don't believe me, trouble gonna come. There's three places trouble come from. Write these down. Trouble can come from you. You cause yourself trouble. Trouble gonna come from other folk. And trouble is going to come from God. That's the three places mostly trouble come from. It comes from yourself messing you up. Come on, many of us know we done messed our own self up. And trouble comes from other people listening to them. And trouble comes from God. What do I mean by messing my own self up? It's when you fail to do what you knew God told you to do. It's when you know what God wants, but you won't give it to him. But you still want blessings. I know anybody listening right now. It's like you decide I'm going to live halfway and still think God going to bless you. And the problem is many of you are missing your blessings because you done made up in your own mind. This is as far as I'm going. And you know God wants you to go further. Let me mess with you a little further. Let me do this. Watch this. And not only that, here's a good area. Forgiveness. So I said, I knew he was going to go there. Some of y'all, some of y'all still aren't forgiving people. Some of y'all still angry about people. God said seven times 70 in one day. And that's some folk you ain't talked to in seven years. Only because you got mad at them. Come on, help me somebody. The next one is anger. The Bible tells us, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And many of us feel we can shout, ask God for blessings. But you didn't realize you just cut off your own blessings because you won't do what you know God told you to do. It means you have to have some obedience. Okay, what's obedience? Deuteronomy chapter 28 says this. If you hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, he said, all these blessings will come on you and overtake you. God said, you're going to be run over by blessings if you just do what I say. You're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed in your body, blessed in your house, blessed in your field. Children are going to be blessed. Okay, all that's good, but it's preceded by obedience. In this simple body, we don't want to do what God says. Anger. I found myself being angry. Um, I've already said, but last night I could not believe I was incredulous that another police officer had shot another young man dead, 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks. I couldn't believe it because we had just come from a protest with uh, George Floyd. And while I was there, I'm trying to be a preacher. I'm trying to act preacherly, but I got to keep my anger down. I just did a series in Matthew where God said, blessed are the peacemakers. But you want to hold on to peace. And I remember I was at the rally yesterday and I kept it cool. I was all preacherly and everything. Till this girl got up who was, who was biracial. 
and she told a horrible story of just what happened now. She got to the mic and she said, uh, I'm biracial. I got a black dad and a white mom. And she said, all through school, I was told I got nappy hair. No. <laughs> all through school, I was told I wasn't anything. But then she said, then I got married. I got a biracial child. They done called my child a monkey. I was sitting there listening to this girl. And all of my peace and calm left. And I had to pull myself back in to start praying. Because I believe if anything's going to happen, there has to be some peace and prayer. But we also got to make sure we understand what to do with our anger. You can't run around your house angry. You got to make sure you understand that you can't be that angry person and expect God to keep blessing you. Oh, I see how some of y'all looking at me with your old mad nasty self. I see, I see. Watch this. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. What did Mordecai do when trouble came? Ooh, write this down. He prayed. So he says, so you ain't said nothing. You just said prayer. No, you missed it. If we knew the authority and the power of prayer, we would pray more. Prayer is not our power. Watch me, somebody. You want to get a shout? Prayer is when I tap into God's power. Prayer is when I say, God, I need you to come on the scene. Prayer, prayer, prayer. What am I talking about prayer? The power of prayer. And 15, watch this. It says that, um, um, it says that Elisha was a man like some of us, and he prayed for three and a half years that there would be no rain, and there was no rain. Then he prayed again, and rain came down. It tells me three things about prayer. Some of y'all sitting out there prayer star. First of all, God hears your prayer. God answers our prayer. And God moves on the power of our prayer. So God said prayer has more power than you thought about. Not only that, prayer not only has power, prayer is the truth of the essence of your walk. Go to Matthew chapter 17 verse 20. Jesus said, the translation is verily I say. That word means the real truth about your power. The real truth is not in your shout. It's not in you walking around talking about how saved you are. It's not in you thinking I got a big Bible. I go down every night. It's not that I've been on the choir for 10 years. It's not that I do. No. Real prayer. The real test is whether or not you know prayer is the only truth. Here's what he said. Here is the truth about the power of prayer. If you have faith Amen. the size of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain out of your life. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. Somebody said, that's the truth, Reverend. That is the truth. Why are you suffering when that's the truth of God's word? Because we don't really believe in our prayer. Not only that, prayer will make the devil go away. Ephesians verse 6 and 18. Praying in the spirit. Do you know when you start praying, devils who are just about to choke you, run away when they see you getting on your knees and pray. They leave your house. They leave your body. They leave your mind. They have to leave you alone. Oh, I'm preaching right now. Y'all better go with me. And when you pray a prayer of thanksgiving, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, when you pray with a smile on your face, when you pray with some praise in your heart, the devil like this, God comes to my mind. And he brings peace. That passive understanding when you pray. But prayer must be lived. I'm getting there. Prayer must be lived. Somebody said, what are you talking about? This man was sitting at the dinner table and he would always complain. Before he prayed for the food, he'd always complain about what his wife cooked. So his daily routine was complain, then pray. His daily routine was to whine, then pray. So one day he was sitting there and, you know, that he still called himself, you know, saved. Okay. So anyway, he was sitting there, he complained, then he prayed. So his daughter asked him a question, said, Dad, does God hear us when we pray? And the father said, it's a chance for me to teach my daughter some spiritual direction. Yes, he does hear you when you pray. She said, uh-huh. Now, does he hear all the other stuff we say the rest of the time? And the man said, yes, God hears every word. He was sitting there, chest all out, thought, I just taught her about connecting with God. Then the girl asked a question he wished she wouldn't have asked. She said, well, Dad... You complain and pray, which one God hear? Maybe the reason God has not answered your prayer, oh, I know you don't like me now, is because you complain before you pray. You whine and pray. You complain and pray. Why don't you just stick with praying and trusting God? You, you know what? You evil and pray. God said, I don't know which one to listen to. I don't know which one you mean because of what we're doing. And then Mordecai, watch out what God does. Mordecai got a word to Esther. He couldn't go in because he was in sackcloth and ashes. Here's what I want to tell you. God will send you, I know I got a witness here, exactly what you need. Amen. Mordecai couldn't get a message to, to Esther, 
But one of the servants got a message back to Esther. You know what happened? God sent people to speak in your life so you can prosper. I told you many times about the story of Dr. Lester Taylor coming over to the hospital when my appendix burst and I didn't know what it was. And I was laying in the, in the, in the driveway and I was passing out. And if Taylor wouldn't have come, I probably wouldn't be here now. That's not the whole story, though. When I got to the hospital, leaking appendix, about to go under in Philadelphia. Nobody knew me. No medical records. Do you realize? Here's a blessing. I didn't think about this till I was writing this sermon last night. As I was sitting there waiting for them to find a surgeon about five minutes, in comes two doctors that had a clear schedule. They were general surgeons. And one of them, I saw them on my little chart. One of them said, uh, that guy, and I'm in much pain sitting there. And then he said, well, I heard him say these words. Well, you know, I don't know why, but I came in early and uh, I can take him in right now. I know why he came in early. God sent him. Oh, God, let's go here. God said, I got a servant. Oh, ho, ho. I got a servant over there about to die. And I want you to make. The man didn't even know why he came in. I'll tell you why he came in. Because God knows how to answer our prayer. And he sent this gentleman into me. Let's get to this. So we got to understand the second point is you got to take some action. So Mordecai, where we picked our text up, went to Esther. And he said to her, get this message to Esther. You got to go before the king. And what I read, what I, what I read when we picked it up is, she said, no, there's a law. If you go before the king and he didn't call, he's going to kill you. So then he told Esther several things. No matter how bad your place is, take action. Three things about action. You got to act on all you know about God. You got to act on all you believe about God. Then when it hasn't happened to you, you got to act on all you read about God. Come on. See, the problem is you're sitting there letting your circumstance take your mind off of God. But if you ever start acting based on what you already know about God, let me get me help you out right here. How many of y'all already know he's a way? I already know he can heal. He's a doctor. How many already know he provides? Come on, sir. How many already know he gives peace that past understanding? How many know he's a midnight prayer answering God? How many know he's an early in the morning God? How many know? So why in the world are you letting your top place stop you from acting on what you know? You got to act. Then you got to act on what you believe about God. What I believe is he has all power in his hands. I got to act up. Look, when my circumstances are closing down on me and I'm getting dark and cloudy, I may not know this, but I got to act on everything. And I got to believe that God has the power to take care of my situation. And not only that, you got to act on what you read about God. Do you realize that sometimes we read some stuff and we won't trust God, but we have to have his word and we have to have his action so we can be blessed. God is preparing us for everything we need to do. Let's get to the heart of the text. How does he prosper Esther in a tough place? First Mordecai prayed, then Mordecai got an answer from God, and then we got to the action part. The action is, Esther, you must act. I'm speaking to somebody personally. Act on what you know. It is the people who act that get the blessing. Amen. What do I mean by that? Um, this basketball player said, I have missed over 9,000 shots. I have been given a chance to do the game-winning shot 26 times and missed. I have missed over 300 free throws, but I kept on shooting over and over and over again. He said, but with all the missing I did, I got six rings. I am Michael Jordan. Let me tell you something. You better quit being afraid to act. It's the people who keep acting that gets the blessing. Some of you don't understand. My Jordan could have gave up. Some of you have given up. When God said, you won't fall down, you might lose it every now and then, you might cry every now and then, but how many know in the end, God gonna get me out? God's gonna bring me through. God's gonna bless me anyhow. Let's get to this, let's get to this. So, so Esther, Esther heard two things. She was afraid to act. Then Mordecai gave her two things. I'm gonna tell you and I'm about to close. Watch this. Mordecai told her, don't think if you don't act, God is done. There's some other folk out there who got the same thing you got. They're going to get healed because they acted and you won't act because God's not going to let his people perish because you won't act. 
Here's what he's saying. Deliverance gonna come from somewhere. Listen, God, if you don't act, God still gonna bless. Somebody else is gonna have the same thing you have. And because you fail to act, you're gonna die and they're gonna live. Why don't you be the one step up to the plate? He said, don't think you're gonna escape. God said, no, if you don't do it, I'll find someone else who will do it. The blessing is, and here's the part I want to tell you, it is a privilege. Y'all might not understand this. When you are crying, when the doctor said no, when you got no money, when things look bleak, when you don't know what you're going to do, and you keep walking toward God, it is a privilege to enter into that zone of the Holy Spirit where God lifts you up to a place that you couldn't get on your own. How many have been crying, didn't know what you were doing, but you walked into the presence of, help me, Holy Ghost, you walked into the presence of God anyhow. And in God's presence, he delivered you because you failed, you refused to give up and quit. Then he said to her, listen, you had to go to the king because God has prepared you for such a time as this. Everybody I can see, lift a hand right now. Watch this. Every tear, every sickness, every broke moment, every time when you didn't know how you were going to make it. Every day when it looks like it was failure, but you're still here, God was just preparing you for your victory. Somebody say, I can handle this tough place because I'm going to prosper in this tough place. God is telling me I'm going to prosper in this tough place. Watch this, watch this. I got one more to go. Don't push me there yet. I'm right there, but one more to listen. And so she said, I'm going to see the king. Let's go to the rest of the story. Haman, I told you, went in, had a feast with Esther, went home and told his people, the king don't want nobody but me. Esther don't want nobody. The queen wants nobody but me and the king to have dinner with her. Wow. On his way, he saw Mordecai. He was angry again. But when he got to the dinner, Esther said, king, he's the one who's been trying to kill me and my people. And Haman started begging for his life. And so the king walked out in his garden to think. When he came back, Haman was hugging Esther. And he, that really made the king mad. He said, you gonna hug my woman in my presence? Then he said, take him away and hang him. All right, that was the part of the shout. Here's the rest. After that, the decree the king did, Haman and Esther went to tell the king. I mean, Mordecai and Esther said, king, can you change the decree? The king said, I can't change the decree. He said, because once I give a decree, I can't change it. And then he said, okay, well, what can you do? He wrote another decree saying that the Jews could defend themselves. When the devil doesn't kill you the first time, you ought to tell him, you should have got me while you had me. Because if I get a chance to call on my Savior, if I ever wake up, I'll hear somebody telling me, if I wake up and remember whose I am, you're in trouble in this house. So the 13th of Adar, 13th of Kadar came. The Jews got together with the help of God, killed their enemies. Here's what happens, how God's providence was in it. Follow me. I'm going to tell you, God's going to flip your situation. You know what he did? The Bible says in that 10th chapter, Mordecai was raised up to a second place in the kingdom. From being promised to die by impalement to living with promotion. Esther became king was obsessed with Esther. She became his pride and joy. The Jewish people now celebrate. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me to the last one. They celebrate. Remember I told you that when Haman wanted to find out how he was going to kill him, he cast a purr that's what the die is called. Well, after they won the battle, they now have a two-day Jewish feast called Feast of the Permit. What they said was, devil, what you meant for my evil turned out to be a reason to dance. Every, every sickness, I'm done. Every tear you cry has gotten you to the place you are now. Every time the devil put a heavy load on your back, the reason you can still shout with joy, you didn't go under. The reason you can cry and know I got hope is because God took what you used to kill 
me and turned it into my dance. When I got out, I was better than I were, than I was before I went in. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm, I'm, I'm every head bowed, every eye closed. I need you to hear me today. You can prosper, not just survive, in tough places. Anybody in a tough place? Get ready. God is orchestrating a new level of blessing. Get ready. What you thought was going to kill you, just making you stronger. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, please, if you're not saved, play this prayer with us today. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Come on, repeat this after me. I know I'm a sinner. I'm tired of trying to make it on my own. I need some help. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again with all power in your hand. And because I confess it and believe it, I am saved. Say it again. I am saved. Say Jesus is Lord. If you go to our website, you can become a member of our church virtually. Just fill out the membership form. We'll be in touch with you. And right now, if you receive the Lord, just call us. And we'll make sure we send you some information that will bless you. Every head bowed in this place, in this part, now, but dismiss us right now. I want you to make a pledge with me. If you will, say these words out loud. Say, I won't just survive. Somebody else. I won't just survive. I won't just make it when I'm in tough places. Now lift a hand in the air if you can and say, I'm going to prosper from everything the enemy tries to do for me. This is Pastor Duncan saying, God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Keep praying for the ministry. We're going to keep doing what God said. God bless you today.